Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Both joined by Drew Galloway today. It is a Thursday. That means it's time to recap what Joe Klanderman and Connor Riley said as they get to be the final spokesman before K-State takes the field on Saturday night against BYU. Before we get into what they said, time to remind everybody that you can join your Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, and exclusive K-State welcome experience and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. All right, uh, let's start. We'll start on the offensive end because Connor Riley's group has probably been the most consistent in people wanting to kind of know what his thoughts are. Obviously, Joe Klanderman had a lot on his plate after the two-lane game, um, and people are probably interested to know how he handled coming off the success of the Arizona game. But more than anything, Connor Riley still has to manage this offense, which no offense unless they score a touchdown on every drive is going to get high marks from fans ever. And he also has a situation in front of him at receiver where that group has not caught a touchdown yet this year. And one of those guys, it's been a main reason for the struggles at times, is Dante Cephas, the Penn State transfer, who's come in, only caught one ball, had some big drops in the game against Arizona, um, hasn't really done anything. So where do you uh, where do you lie with what you heard from uh, Connor Riley today about Dante Cephas. Yeah, I think it was one of uh, Connor Riley's best answers because uh, he was just asked like, "Where is your confidence with Dante Cephas?" And I mean, it, it's it's a valid question for how Cephas has played in the first three games. And he just said that he felt for uh, Cephas this week because he had the two big drops and has started to see his playing time diminish a little bit. But said that he still has all the confidence in him. And that it sounds like Cephas had a, a good week of prep, kind of getting ready for a BYU. So you're encouraged to hear that. And, and at the same time, too, but you also need to see it on the field. Like, we we can't have another game where Dante Cephas has, like, one catch or zero catches and is just kind of out there. Like, I, I think that I wouldn't be totally shocked to see K-State kind of try and get him going early on in the game just kind of build confidence, like maybe run like a screen or something. Is that a good idea? And, is he going to catch it if you do that? I, I think that it, it, it's at least worth a shot to maybe see if you can spark something with him and kind of get him going early on. Because, I mean, you kind of saw that uh, in the Pop-Tarts Bowl against NC State when Garrett Oakley had a couple drops. That The next drive, it felt like K-State went right back to Oakley to kind of keep him in the game. So if you can do that with Dante Cephas this week, I, I don't think it's necessarily a terrible thing. Where it starts to compound is if you if he makes the mistakes again and you see him and Avery Johnson out on the same page again, th that's where you probably move on. Yeah, I just uh, I'm I'm not fully sold on that, and I, maybe it's one of those two where uh, you can you could think about maybe if you just go out there run a normal drive. And then if you're in a successful position, then you can try to be a little bit more selective and, hey, let's let's get the ball to him early. I could understand that. I just – a situation like this, I don't want to go into a game and say, hey, we're going to feed the guy that's been the most underwhelming at a position we're struggling at right now. I think you have to kind of step up uh, and just roll with whoever's going to make the plays for you. But – in reality, it's good that Connor Riley still has that confidence. And even though right now I'm very down on Dante Cephas, there's a part of me that still holds out that he can do something. Like the traits are there. I, you know, guys just go through these patches one way or the other. Um, and I think it'd be beneficial for K State to have Dante Cephas step up. So you don't just want to toss him to the side after three games and say, all right, well, you're not really going to do anything for us this year. So see ya. Um, I, I think you want to try to continue to work him in. I just think you got to be a little bit more selective about it. Uh, what else did Connor Riley have to say about his offense, whether how they performed against Arizona or uh, how things set up for them against BYU? I think that the, one of the other interesting things 
was just about the crowd noise and the crowd factor because as as the two lane game went on, it still wasn't like a terribly hostile environment. You could honestly argue that the K State fans were louder for a majority of the game more than the two lane fans were. But this week, you kind of expect that to be pretty heavily in BYU's favor, although there are a lot of K State fans going to the game. Uh, but you kind of hear about K State doing more noise in practice, and it sounds like Tuesday they did a better job than yesterday. And yesterday there were some breakdowns, uh, but there there are going to be mistakes, and I think that Connor Riley knows that. He even said that uh, today that we can do what we can to kind of eliminate the mistakes as best as we can. But when the mistake happens, we can't let that compound. And he talked about Arizona State in 2022 playing kind of this late kickoff against BYU on the road. And it was a ranked uh, Arizona State team that went into Provo. And they had, I think he said, eight procedural penalties and had like three or four in a row. And like, you just can't have that if you're K-State. But he also said, like, we have 11 humans in here. So like, we are going to make a mistake probably because of the crowd noise. But you can't have six to eight of those in one game because that, that's how you lose a game. When, when you're a favorite going on the road to a team that doesn't necessarily have the best offense in the world. Well, so. And if, if Connor Riley is concerned about penalties, the, the group that I would point to is the group that he's mainly in charge of as well. The offensive line have made some silly penalties early on in the season. I, I mentioned the last two weeks, Carver Willis has had an eligible man downfield penalties. There have been some others. That, that would be the concern there is that this unit of offensive linemen that's still trying to find a way to, to work together and, and feel each other out. They have been the ones more prone to commit the penalties and which in on the offense, like it's just more likely that offensive linemen are going to commit penalties because it's easier for them to, but at the end of the day, they've already done it in some ways, not to like a serious extent where it's every single drive or something, but They've been ones that you just kind of scratch your head and go, man, you, you should probably should not be doing that right now. Yeah, it, it's I think it's more of eliminating them in like big moments. And then when they happen, just don't let it compound because you can't have two, three penalties in a row, especially the procedural penalties. No doubt about it. Uh, all right. Anything else from Connor Riley you want to get to before you uh, enlighten everybody about your Joe Klanderman thoughts today? Uh, I think that the other thing is just that the tight ends getting a lot of touchdowns is just kind of utilizing play action for K State in the red zone. And I, I think that we've seen that on all of the tight end touchdowns. Actually, it's been off of play action in the red zone, and a tight end has just gotten open. And they're utilizing the ability of everybody on the team because you're utilizing the running backs because that, that's what's sucking the defense in. And then just utilizing the the playmaking ability of the tight ends that K State has to score the touchdowns, and I, I I think that that's probably been the biggest strength of Connor Riley as an offensive coordinator has been the play calling in the red zone because you watch all of those touchdowns that the tight ends have scored. I, I don't think that there's been a, a defender really anywhere near a tight end except for that one Braden Lofton touchdown. Uh, last week, but the the closest defender was still probably three or four steps back. Yeah, that, you know that that's one of the things I, I mentioned earlier in the week is that there can be criticisms of how Connor Riley has done things, but long term, I don't know that I have a ton of concern for him doing this job because he's shown that he can be good at scheming guys open and the part of the field where it can be so difficult to come through is when you get down there inside the 15, 10 yard line. And that's where he's really thrived as a play caller through the first three weeks of the season. And then overall, it was a lot better last week too, against Arizona. So uh, I'll be interested to see what it looks like this week and just where some of the creativity goes now, when you consider the fact that uh, teams will be more than aware at this point that K-State likes to go to those tight ends in those situations uh, and I think that's going to open up even more things that he can do to kind of blow people's minds. So uh, I look forward to how the, the play calling looks in those situations this week against BYU and beyond. Uh, flipping sides of the ball, Joe Klanderman, maybe one of the most hated men uh, around halftime uh, or even late third quarter of that Tulane game, and everything got turned around 
yeah, basically by halftime of the Arizona game when it looked like Arizona may not find the end zone. Um, what did he have to say this week? Yeah, the, the most interesting thing that I think is that it, it's still a work in progress for the defense, and kind of how he explained it was it made a lot of sense, and you kind of look at what K-State has in the starters and what they have depth-wise, and I think that that's kind of what he's implying here because he said that he still doesn't know what the defense really is yet because he said that there's a, a core group of guys, and I would imagine that's probably most of the starters, where he knows what they're going to do every single day and that they're big-time competitors and they're like the most consistent players on the team. Uh, but there's, he said that there's another group of players that he doesn't know what they're going to do because they're still developing and kind of as they go and develop and grow as the season goes on, that's going to be where K-8 grows as a defense. And, and you really look at what K-8 has depth-wise. Asa Newsom played in four games, got hurt last year. One of your, that's one of your backup linebackers. Austin Romain is still only a true sophomore, so you imagine that as he grows and develops more, that that'll help K-8's defense. Chidi Obeyser, Ryan Davis, Travis Bates, are all still really young guys. So I think that what he said makes sense. And, and that this the group of starters, you kind of know what you're going to get. It's can you get consistent play from guy number 12 to like 18? And that's going to be what makes K-State really take off defensively. Uh, what else do you take away from Joe Klanderman today since uh, his unit has had guys from really all levels show up in a big way to start the year? I mean, we... We think about Brendan Mott is kind of playing to what I think most people expected him to be after the 2022 season. Austin Romain, you mentioned, and you know Austin Moore and Des Purnell have also been really good this year. Uh, and then his DBs, they had a, a better game, obviously, against Arizona, and Keenan Garber made a heck of a play. So he's got a number of guys he can choose from to kind of shout out and feel good about right now going into this game. Uh, how does he think they can attack BYU? Yeah, he felt really good about the defensive line and, and how they played against Arizona. And he said kind of what we said in answer, or the answer reaction, actually, that the, the numbers don't blow you away, like from a, a raw statistical standpoint, only one sack. But he pointed out that they made uh, lots of pressures and kind of got Fafita to move around more in a, a spot where he wasn't as comfortable with, where he wasn't able to throw on the run as much. And then so this it's the same philosophy this week against Jake Retzloff, where he is more of a scrambler, but you're going to have the same uh, rules and principles for the defensive line. And, and he was really uh, complimentary, too, about uh, Damian Alalio and Uso Samalo, uh, just saying that there are times where he doesn't know which one of them is out there because he doesn't care because he feels comfortable with both of them, and they're both playing at a really high level right now. And I, I think that that's pretty true, honestly. Like, you look at the entire K-State defensive line so far this year, that's probably been the best unit on defense. Yeah, and that's probably encouraging and good news for people to hear too because Damian Leo snags the starting spot uh, on the defensive line there. And I think most of the, the assumption and talk had just kind of been like Uso's kind of lagging behind. He He's he's fallen back. Um, but for Joe Klanderman to come in and say, look, we're, we're pleased with how both of them are playing, uh, that should be encouraging news for K-State fans to hear that they – have two guys at a spot that going into this season, that was kind of the wild card, but both of those guys appear to be stepping up right now, at least uh, through the first quarter of the year. Yeah, and, and I think that that's really important at that spot because you only have four scholarship guys at it. So if you can get the top two, and I think that they're playing a lot better than they did last year. And I think that you're really seeing that with k being able to stop the run more. It's because both of those guys are doing their job in the middle. Uh, anything else from Joe Klanderman that you took away today uh, as he gets ready for K-State BYU? Yeah, it's just an, a, really an in general kind of statement about BYU that he thinks that the best, uh, st the biggest strength of BYU's team is their receiving core. And it was really complimentary about Chase Roberts for BYU, which I mean, that, that's a guy that's probably going to the NFL and just saying that this is going to be another challenge for the secondary and, and the corners because – BYU's got tall, big, long receivers, and, and it's kind of like Arizona last week. All, all of Arizona's receivers were tall. It's the same with BYU. So Keenan, Keenan Garber and Jake Pierce are going to have to play big and play physical again Saturday. 
Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, that is uh, the takeaways from this week's appearances from Connor Riley and Joe Klanerman. You can watch their press conferences in full over on the KSO YouTube page right now and uh, get the lowdown there. Next time that you hear from KSO, at least on the podcast or YouTube, it will be our preview, DY and I talking K-State, BYU, and also whipping around the rest of the Big 12 this week. And there's a lot of fascinating matchups in the Big 12 uh, this week. And then uh, we'll have plenty of coverage written and uh, up on the boards over the next couple of hours and really until we get to Utah uh, on Friday afternoon, evening. And then it'll be looking ahead to game coverage, and there will be plenty of time to wait around for that to kick off uh, with the, the later start there. Good news is, Drew, when we wake up on Saturday, we'll be an hour closer to kickoff than usual. We'll only have to wait till 10 a.m. So look at the positives, not the negatives, uh, with how things are setting up. But for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online. Back again tomorrow with the K-State BYU Preview.